vehicle, go to RadioIQ.org. And thanks. Funding for Here and Now comes from the listeners of WBUR Boston and from MathWorks, creators of MATLAB and Simulink software for technical computing and model-based design. MathWorks, accelerating the pace of discovery in engineering and science. Learn more at MathWorks.com. And Indeed, designed to be an end-to-end hiring solution to help businesses attract, interview, and hire candidates all from one place. Learn more at Indeed. Indeed.com slash NPR. It's here and now. The Emmys came back with gusto in a televised award ceremony last night, just like the old days before the pandemic. Among the big winners, Ted Lasso, Succession, and The White Lotus. For more on the winners and the losers and all the drama in between, we're joined by critic Glenn Weldon of NPR's Pop Culture Happy Hour. Glenn, great to have you. Oh, thanks for having me. So the show returned to its pre-pandemic format, complete with comedian hosts, tearful acceptance speeches. How did the production go? Well, I mean, it was big chaos energy, uh, but that's part of the deal, right? They understood the assignment. It was hosted by Keenan Thompson. He's very genial. They opened with this big old school production number where they danced to remixes of classic TV theme songs. Most of the Brady kids showed up for uh-huh. No readily discernible reason, <laughs> but clearly the marching orders here were to keep it light, keep it frothy, avoid controversy, avoid politics, make it a party atmosphere. You seat everyone at tables, which is what they did last night. You uh, give them plenty of booze, which is what they did last night. And then you <laughs> proceed to inundate us with meaningless montages that eat up all kinds of time. It was a very old school formula last night, Anthony. Felt a bit dated, I gotta say, but it's a formula for a reason, you know? <laughs> okay, well, sounds like a party anyway. So, Glenn, aside from the production itself, tell us about the standout moments and the big winners. Well, I mean, sometimes it's hard to pick because one speech blends into the other, lots of lists of agents and managers, but that was not true last night. Uh, When the Great and the Good, Cheryl Lee Ralph won Outstanding Supporting Actress in a Comedy for Abbott Elementary. There was this electric charge as she made her way to the stage very slowly, because she's a pro. She just planted herself in front of that mic and proceeded to blow the roof off the dump. I am a woman, I am a no. And I know where my voice belongs. Uh-huh. Wow, wow. You perhaps see what I'm going to get yeah, there. I mean, wow. that's the first verse of Diane Reeves' song, Endangered Species, and then she went on to deliver a barn burner of a speech. To anyone who has ever, ever had a dream and thought your dream wasn't, wouldn't, couldn't come true, I am here to tell you that this is what believing looks like. I mean, you see what I mean. Trust me, that was the best speech of the night, one of the best Emmy speeches in my memory, because Ralph has been out here. She's been putting in the work forever. She's done Broadway. She's been on TV for 30 plus years. This was her night. That sounded like quite a moment. And it sounds like it was a a big night for other black women as well. Well, I mean, yeah, comparatively, because there have been recent years where we get a lot of nominations for black women, but not a lot of wins. But last night, Zendaya won as lead actress in a drama series for her role on Euphoria. She's won that before. Quinta Brunson, who created Abbott Elementary, won for best writing in a comedy series for that show. Now, There's an asterisk there because she had to share it with uh, Jimmy Kimmel, who was doing a bit where he was lying at her feet as part of his own bit. And uh, so she had to kind of literally step over him to give her speech. That wasn't a good look. And the singer Lizzo also gave another uh, knockout acceptance speech when her show Watch Out for the Big Girls won Best Original Competition. That was an upset win over RuPaul's Drag Race. We should say that in her acceptance speech, she used some salty language. When I was a little girl, all I wanted to see was me in the media. Someone fat like me, black like me, beautiful like me. (laughs) If I could go back and tell little Lizzo something, I'd be like, you're going to see that person, but bitch is going to have to be you. (laughs) (laughs) So, Glenn, what were some of the other big surprises? Were there other surprises? 
I mean, a big one was Squid Game. I mean, this is a blockbuster Netflix hit Korean show that won, an, I think, an unexpected level of recognition last night. So star Lee jung Get won Best Actor in a Drama. He was the first Asian actor to win in that category. And the show's director and creator, Hwang Dong-hyuk, also won for his work, and he was very appreciative. Since Squid Game got 14 nominations at the Emmys, people keep telling me, like, uh, I made the history, but I don't think I made the history by myself. Because it was you who opened up the door for Squid Game, invited us here tonight at the Emmys. So I believe, I have to say, we made all history together. So if Squid Game was the surprise, if you look at uh, the other big awards, Best Comedy, Best Drama, we actually saw a lot of predictable picks, right? Yeah, I mean, the Emmys tend to be slow to embrace the new. They tend to reward what they've already rewarded. And if you went in last night just counting nominations, which is kind of a smart thing to do, you'd expect that Ted Lasso would win for comedy, Succession would win for drama, and The White Lotus would win for limited series. That's exactly what happened. Uh, a lot of folks like me were pulling for Better Call Saul to finally get some recognition. It didn't last night, but they divided up that show's final season into two halves. The second half is going to be eligible next year. Now, if Ted Lasso and Succession... Um, I would like to uh, introduce uh, Pastor Eddie Crabtree from the, the Valley Word Church. Uh, I'm going to ask the pastor to maybe tell us a little bit about his church and some of the things that he and his congregation are doing. Uh, then after that, uh, Pastor, you tell me when you're ready and please uh, join us in invocation. I'll, I'll ask everybody in the audience, if you want to join us, you may stand up and join us for the invocation. So, pastor? Thank you, sir. First, I'd like to say what an honor it is to be here and actually how blessed we are to, to reside. Both our church and Debbie and I as individuals reside in Roanoke County and have so for the majority of our life. And uh, we recognize the hard work that you guys put in uh, concerning Roanoke County and uh, 
it's a great place to live, and we thank you for that. Thank you. So uh, our, our Pastor Valley Word Church, we, I have been there for 27 and a half years now, and during that time we've seen all the ups and downs as we all have, uh, and the church is doing really well, and uh, we, one of our favorite things now is we've just partnered with a uh, private Christian school who moved from Roanoke City to the county, and uh, now our church is, is buzzing like a beehive with uh, 230 students plus, I think they said 44 teachers. So, uh, you know, it's awesome to see us come together and a building that the Lord really gave us is uh, now not just being used on Sundays and Wednesdays, but being used all week long. So it's just a real exciting thing for all of us. Here again, they're now in Roanoke County, so we appreciate that. Great. So I'm ready. Um, if you want to join us uh, and want to stand up for the invocation, please do. If not, you can remain sitting. And then after the invocation, uh, I'd like to have you join us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Pastor. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to once again come together, talk about the things concerning the Valley, but specifically Roanoke County. Father, it is such an honor and a privilege to be a part of this great community. Father, I ask that you give us all wisdom and direction concerning the running of the business of this county and the things that you have before us. Father, we thank you that this is a good and safe place to live and to work. And so we ask you, Father God, that your protection be upon all of us. May your presence be felt and seen, and may people talk about how wonderful it is to be a part of this county. Father, we thank you for this, the Board of Supervisors. We ask you, Father God, to minister life to them and through them. Father, we ask that protection be theirs. And Father, may they live in the best days of their life. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Good afternoon and welcome to our meeting for September 13th, 2022. Regular meetings are held on the second and fourth Tuesdays at 3 o'clock p.m. Public hearings are held at 7 o'clock p.m. on the fourth Tuesday of each month. Deviations from this schedule will be announced. Uh, meetings are broadcast live on RVTV Channel 3 and will be rebroadcast on Thursday at 7 o'clock p.m. and on Sunday from 10 a.m. until 5 o'clock p.m. Board of Supervisor meetings can also be viewed online through Roanoke County's website at www.roanokecountyva.gov. Our meetings are closed captioned. So it is important that everyone speak directly into the microphones at the podium. Individuals uh, who require assistance or special arrangements to participate in or attend Board of Supervisor meetings should contact the clerk to the board at 540-772-2005 at least 48 hours in advance. And then please turn off your cell phones or put them on silent. Thank you. Item A on our agenda, opening ceremonies, is roll call. Madam Clerk. Mr. Peters. Here. Mrs. Hooker. Here. Mr. Norworth. Here. Mr. Radford. Here. Mr. Mahoney. Here. Item B on our agenda, request to postpone or to change the order of agenda items. Um, I would ask uh, if there are any requests to postpone, add, or change the order of the agenda. I do want to announce that item C1 on our agenda, uh, Nancy Gattoni, hope I pronounced that correctly, uh, she's unable to attend today's meeting, so item C1 will be moved to our consent agenda. Uh, does any board member have any request to change or postpone yes, or add? Mr. Kaywood? No changes, sir. Mr. Lubeck? No changes, sir. Thank you. <clears throat> Um, as I said, item C1 has been uh, moved to our consent agenda. Item C2 <clears throat> is a resolution expressing the appreciation of the Board of Supervisors of Roanoke County to Darlene Smittick uh, for public 
public service as librarian upon her retirement after more than 21 years of service. Uh, Tony Cox, please uh, come to the podium and uh, I'll ask the clerk to read the resolution. Resolution expressing the appreciation of the Board of Supervisors of Rona County to Darlene Smithwick, Public Services Librarian, upon her retirement after more than 21 years of service. Whereas Darlene Smithwick was employed by Rona County on June 13, 2001, and whereas Ms. Smithwick retired on September 1, 2022, after 21 years and three months of devoted faithful and expert service to Rona County. And whereas Ms. This is a tongue twister. Smithwick, through her employment with Roanoke County, has been instrumental in improving the quality of life and providing services to the citizens of Roanoke County. And whereas throughout Ms. Smithwick's tenure with Roanoke County, she has served the library in a variety of ways. She developed partnerships and programming for adults that benefited the library system. For many years, she served as webmaster and taught computer classes for the public county employees and businesses in Roanoke. She created social media accounts for the library and spoke at local civic groups, always advertising our upcoming events. Some of her most popular programs were Mystery Nights, Dead Authors Month, the Virginia Voices series, and Blind Date with a Book. Mrs. Smithwick's gift of listening to people's stories made her a natural at developing partnerships, including ones with Blue Ridge PBS, the DMV, and Voices of Faith. Her skill in providing outreach services brought us several little free libraries located in the Runnett County Park System, and most recently, she started providing library services at the Catawba Valley Farmers Market. In creating all of these connections, she leaves behind a well-connected community thanks to her love of public service. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Board of Supervisors of Roanoke County expresses its deepest appreciation and the appreciation of the citizens of Roanoke County to Darlene Smithwick for more than 21 years of capable, loyal, and dedicated service to Roanoke County. And further, the Board of Supervisors does express its best wishes for a happy and productive retirement. I would ask for a motion to approve the resolution. Motion to approve. We have a motion. Second. Second. We have a second. Madam Clerk. Mr. Peters? Yes. Mrs. Hooker? Yes. Mr. North? Yes. Mr. Radford? Yes. Mr. Mahoney? Yes. Ms. Cox, I think you have a few words. <laughs> <laughs> yes, thank you. Um, thank you. It's, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I was Darlene's supervisor for several years, and it was amazing to see all the connections that she did make. She knows everybody. Um, she even brought Peter Gross from Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom to the old library on 419. That was a long time ago. Um, she was in tune with what people were interested in, and she held a Downton Abbey tea party, which brought in 100 people on a cold January night. She had a World War II veterans program and filled the 200-seat auditorium at South County to capacity. She was always thinking of creative ways to get people to the library, and one of the last great connections that she'd made was the Catawba Farmers Market. Because of her, we have so many partnerships and connections with the community, so it was a privilege to work with her. Would you like to say a few things? You have the podium. Well, I, I didn't plan to, but I, I just want to um, thank Tony for her kind words and, um, and thank the county. This was a great opportunity for me, and I loved working at the Roanoke County Public Library. Thank you. Well, the county has a small gift for you. Thank you. Oh. And uh, does any board member have any comments? Just thank you for your service. Yeah, we you. so appreciate it. And I think uh, Amy would like to take a photo. Oh, dear. 
Thank you. Next item on our agenda is a resolution expressing the appreciation of the Board of Supervisors to Robin Walters, uh, Library Department Budget Specialist upon her retirement after more than 44 years of service. Madam Clerk, would you please read the resolution? Resolution expressing the appreciation of the Board of Supervisors of Rona County to Robin Walters, Library Budget Specialist, on her retirement after more than 44 years of service. Whereas Robin Walters was employed by Rona County on July 31st, 1979, and whereas Ms. Walters retired on September 1st, 2022, after 44 years and one month of devoted, faithful, and expert service to Rennick County. And whereas Ms. Walters, through her employment with Rennick County, has been instrumental in improving the quality of life and providing services to the citizens of Rennick County. And whereas, throughout Ms. Walters' tenure with Rennick County, she held several positions at the library, starting out as a page and quickly moving into a full-time position processing library cards. Her devotion to the library and excellent work ethic promoted her to senior library assistant responsible for ordering and purchasing library materials selected by the librarians and was instrumental in purchasing opening day collections for each of the new branch libraries. Mrs. Walters assisted with the materials budget and helped to compile statistics for the library. Ms. Walters most recently worked as department budget specialist, providing excellent customer service to her co-workers and patrons. Mrs. Walters acted with grace and dedication in service to all those around her. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Board of Supervisors of Rona County expresses its deepest appreciation and appreciation of the citizens of Rona County to Robin Walters for more than 40 years of capable, loyal, and dedicated service to Rennick County. And further, the Board of Supervisors does express its best wishes for a happy and productive retirement. I would ask for a motion to approve the resolution. Motion. Second. We have a motion and a second. Madam Clerk. Mr. Peters. Yes. Mrs. Hooker. Yes. Mr. Nor. Yes. Mr. Radford. Yes. Mr. Mahoney. Yes. Ms. Cox, or is it, uh, I have on my list here, Sarah McKnight. Are both of you speaking? <laughs> no, please. Tell well, me. I have prepared some things. Oh, good. And then maybe Sarah can come up if she, if she wants to. Um, so for most of Robin's tenure, she was in charge of ordering all the supplies for the library, and she was on the phone with the vendors for a large part of her day. She had a great reputation with them, and they asked about her often. She was in charge of purchasing all the items that we needed to have programs for the public. On more than one occasion, we had an employee call her at the last minute in a panic because something had not yet arrived for the program. Robin went above and beyond to make sure that the staff member had the materials they needed in order for the program to happen. No matter how many mistakes people made with their orders or their timesheets, Robin was always so patient and gentle in making sure that things were done correctly. She truly cared about it, her work, and it showed. Would you like to say a few words? Uh, I, I enjoyed working for the county. It was a good 44 years, and I enjoyed it. That's mine there. <laughs> I just want to thank Robin for everything that she's done for me, and she's been such a great support and helpful to all the new employees that have been coming in. So thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Comments from board members? Yeah, I just, uh, you know, working 40 years, 44 years for the same firm, company, whatever, that's a long time. Dedication, we really appreciate that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, numbers got to add up, and I'm glad you were there. Well, I love the library system. Yes, and that too. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. You know, if we look on our agenda, we have three employees that we are going to recognize today. And if you look at the number of years of service, um, I think that that says a lot for us and how good and great our library system is. What worries me is we're losing a lot of wonderful experience. Mm -hmm. And it's... It's really hard to replace that kind of experience. But thank you for your service. We have a county has a small gift for you. Thank you. And uh, Amy would like to take a picture. If not, Mr. Chairman, I, I noticed that too. Between the three retirees, it's 105 years. Yes. Yes. Looks like 
Luckily, they're not moving, so we can call them. <laughs> <laughs> I bet you will. <laughs> All right. Uh, next item on our agenda, item D, is a briefing. And a briefing to discuss, and I don't know if I could pronounce that, so I'll just call it PFAS with the Board of Supervisors. Mr. McAvoy or Scott Shirley, come on up, please. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, members of the board, and county manager, and, and uh, clerk. We appreciate the uh, county's interest in this emerging topic made the news recently and we're happy to provide an update on what we're doing to protect the water resources. So. Did it come up? To start the there you go. So specifically today we're going to talk about the application of uh, PFOS is, is what we've come to call it is, is kind of our shorthand uh, and how that is, is associated with uh, Spring Hollow. So in today's presentation, we're going to cover what are PFOS compounds, testing results for Roanoke's water resources, what is HFPODA, so a lot of these are a mouthful and, and that's often referred to as Gen X, uh, what does EPA's recent health advisory mean, how should the public view that, uh, and then what's next on our agenda and, and plan for addressing issues that we find in the Roanoke Valley. So PFOS is shorthand for polyfluoroalkyl compounds. And so these are compounds that are uh, consist of a carbon bond uh, between carbon and fluorine. And so they're very commonly used uh, chemical compounds. You'll kind of see on the list, they're present in everything from food wrappers, uh, water stain resistant coatings on our furniture, on our clothing, uh, firefighting foams. So they're highly present in the environment. In fact, for some time, the CDC has been monitoring the blood levels of Americans. And it's one of those compounds that's so prevalent in the, in the uh, environment that most Americans will show some concentration of these compounds in their bloodstreams. So uh, P PFOA and PFOS are two of the most studied compounds and have been recognized for a bit longer in terms of environmental awareness and action by EPA. And so there's been far more research on those compounds over the years than virtually any other, any other elements of this class. But this is a very large class of chemicals. And so you have numerous compounds, some that are not of concern because they tend to not be mobile in the environment or they do not accumulate or pose a threat. But then others in the class may, and emerging science indicate that they in fact may be harmful. So PFOS compounds in drinking water. Uh, so currently EPA does not have a drinking water regulation for these compounds. So they, they have progressed and there was a little bit of confusion on the recent action that that was a regulatory limit. That's not what was passed. Uh, so there is not currently a regulatory limit on, the, on these compounds. The health advisory will eventually evolve, is expected to evolve into a regulatory limit uh, under the Safe Drinking Water Act. So in 2016, EPA, and this is a fairly rapidly evolving regulatory topic, a little faster than we typically see issues uh, generated at the federal level, but in 2016, EPA took action and passed a, uh, an initial health advisory uh, specifically for PFOA and PFOS at 70 parts per trillion as a health advisory. And so that was the health advisory that most people um, paid attention to. That, that's what was viewed as, as kind of the standard for comparison of whether a water body had any problems at the time. Uh, as kind of a point on this, uh, part per trillion is roughly one second in 32,000 years. 
So we're talking about in, in our reports, we say it is nine, nanograms per liter. So this is a very, very small uh, portion of, of any water body when you're talking parts per trillion. And so that's confusing at times because it's just difficult to grasp numbers this low. In fact, there's only a handful of laboratories in the United States that can even test to this low for these compounds. So that it, there is a growing list, but as of present, there's just a handful of laboratories that can do this work. So the lifetime health advisory, what's the intent of a, a health advisory? When EPA generates a health advisory, this is assuming a person lives a standard lifetime of 70 years, and then if they're exposed at this level over those 70 years from drinking two liters of water a day, which is really a large volume of water, they, they could be expected to have health impacts. And so that's an important distinction to understand when you're talking about regulatory limits. Is it a health advisory or is it a regulatory limit? And so this at this time is a health advisory that we'll be discussing today. So as part of this, the authority, this effort to determine prevalence in the environment, the authority uh, has sampled Carver's Cove, Spring Hollow, Crystal Springs, and we found no PFOS compounds at any of the three, three facilities except for one compound that was detected at Spring Hollow, and that is HFPODA, also called Gen X. So Virginia does not uh, have a state standard for PFOS or any of these compounds at this point either. Uh, we, we have done research and we looked when this was first detected. So Michigan has a, a, a limit. Their regulatory limit for HFPODA was 300 parts per trillion. And then North Carolina right next door to us had, it, had a regulatory, um, had an advisory at 140 parts per trillion. So we'll talk a little more specifically about what is HFPODA or Gen X. So Gen X or HFPODA is not an end product in and of itself. So typically on this product, it's used to manufacture other PFOS, PFOA, those compounds. It's used as part of the manufacturing process. It's generally not present or expected to be present in manufactured goods. Uh, there, there are potentially exceptions to that that are being researched. Uh, fluoridated HDPE containers and the ability of some materials to leach that out of the containers. So, so that's still ongoing research, but generally it's not found except in instances where there's a direct connection to a manufacturing facility. And fluoropolymers are an important uh, compound in our modern life. And so they're present in chip manufacturing, the automotive industry, uh, production of hydrogen fuel cells. So they're used across, as, as I mentioned earlier, a myriad of, of products that the public uses every day. So the properties of these particular class of chemicals include water resistance, oil resistance, heat resistance. And so periodically you'll hear them called, uh, as they've been referenced in some of the stories, the forever chemical. And it's partly because they are so resistant that they're also popular and important in a lot of consumer goods. HFPODA was actually a, a replacement for PFOA, which was an earlier. So these compounds have been around since the 1940s. And so PFOA was recognized as having some health risk. And so the manufacturers had begun a process to research and formulate a replacement uh, for this particular compound that's used in the process. And so Gen X became that replacement, or HFPODA, and it was assumed to be a safer alternative because they had evidence that it does not bioaccumulate. But EPA has studied this. Uh, it is present in a couple communities in the United States. And they're studying this primarily because it is mobile in the environment, it does persist in the environment, and now there's beginning to be some evidence that it has adverse uh, uh, impacts on liver and kidney function. And so obviously with, with those type red flags in the data, it requires additional study and additional work, which is ongoing. So the good news, there's a limited number of manufacturers around the country that actually produce or handle this material. And so um, the, the universe of potential 
uh, sources for it are relatively small. So talk a little bit more about the testing at Spring Hollow that's been complete. And so the General Assembly uh, did request that VDH uh, consider this issue in the Commonwealth as it began to, to gain uh, awareness nationally. And so VDH conducted a study, a uh, sampling study, where they went out and looked at some of the largest water utility sources uh, in the Commonwealth to just try to understand and help quantify whether the Commonwealth uh, had a significant issue with these compounds. So the sampling, as I mentioned earlier, it looked at uh, all uh, a broad class of these chemicals. The only constituent of this class that was found was the HFPODA uh, at Spring Hall. We did, again did not have any uh, hits or results for any compounds at Carbon's Cove or, um, or Crystal Springs. So this is a, a chart that shows the current results uh, at at finished water testing at Spring Hollow. So in January 2020, we had our first result, and so it was 61 uh, parts per trillion. And so in context, during that time period, the public health advisory for, uh, and it did not include uh, HFPODA, it included the other compounds that were recognized earlier was 70 parts per trillion. Uh, so the only point of comparison we had at that point was the, the state of Michigan and North Carolina at 300 and 140 parts per trillion. So with that result and our awareness that the compound may be present, uh, we proceeded with additional sampling. You can see it escalates over time. Uh, we began to trend, look at, uh, it, because this sample is so prevalent in the environment, it requires highly specific uh, instructions to sampling staff to make sure that we don't unintentionally contaminate a sample. So you have to work through that whole process to ensure that the employee didn't use personal care products right before sampling, that they were very careful on the clothing. Uh, I know our staff have been removing their shoes. Uh, shoes can be a source. And so it, it's just that sensitive of a test that we had to go through kind of the internal process to make sure and understand, was there anything wrong within our testing procedure that could generate this? So we were doing that work uh, through this time period. So you can see the results were persistent though. And so we were using the same sampling protocols, but uh, Teflon tubing, all those things we, we had to work through and evaluate. Uh, I am pleased to note as of July, and we'll talk a little bit more about why, so you see the trend down for the most part, a couple extraneous increases, but in July we have substantially increased testing. And so the, the uh, last result on this slide was a 15, but I will share that recently we, uh, we actually saw a non-detect in finished water from some of the things we're doing, and I'll talk a little bit about that. And I should reference, so as soon as we became aware of this particular issue, uh, we have had for some time information published on the authority website for consumers to be able and, and be aware of this. And then while not required by the Commonwealth, we did make a decision to go ahead and modify our consumer confidence report that's published annually and goes out to our customers to make customers aware that this particular issue has been identified. So what changed to kind of drive some of the recent interest? Well, in June of this year, EPA uh, announced a new health advisory. And so not only for the compounds that they had previously recognized and had an existing health advisory at 70 parts per trillion, but then also they included new compounds, one of which is HFPODA, the particular compound that, that we're discussing today. So the old health advisory, as I mentioned, it was 70 parts per trillion, but there was no limit applied to HFPODA. And so it was not recognized at the federal level. The new health advisory that was issued in June of this year established a, a limit of 10 parts per trillion for HFPODA. So these were fairly drastic reductions uh, and, and frankly, even a little bit lower than what was expected based on some of the science. Um, there are other federal agencies that are tasked with looking at 
um, advisories uh, with the CDC. And so these, there was a little bit of difference in, in uh, some of the numbers from those agencies versus EPAs. So EPA also, they did recommend uh, actions that utilities could take. Uh, this is a new emerging contaminant. And so there's limited options in terms of treatment, uh, courses of action the utilities can take. Uh, thankfully, Rona County years ago, when Spring Hollow was built, made one really good choice that's, that's serving us well in addressing this, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, the one thing that is important to note that EPA did not recommend is the use of bottled water. And so we have had some comments, some questions about that, and so, if the water itself has not been sampled for this and that's not required for bottled water, uh, that's not a recommendation by EPA at this point. So prior to June, we drastically increased uh, our sampling events to try to understand and begin the process of identifying source. Uh, we've done tons and tons of research on the chemistry of this particular compound, the processes that may be generated from it, uh, we've kind of looked at everything. Uh, it's, it's like any environmental issue, determining where it comes from can be a challenge. Uh, but we also initiated, and what I mentioned earlier, so the county installed granular activated carbon as one of the original process at Spring Hollow. And so that was originally installed to deal with total organic carbons. And so that's an organic, and that helps for helps remove organics from the water so that you decrease the risk of chlorination byproducts. And so that was uh, installed and present, and that is one of the two recognized technologies that's available to treat for this compound. Now, it's a different uh, process, different contact time, so we're in the, in the efforts of optimizing that system currently. Um, so we began a process, we replaced the GAC filter media. Um, actually began some modifications of the existing system to get it ready for treatment. And then we have requested funding assistance from VDH. So next steps for us, we plan to continue sampling and reporting to the public. So this will continue to be updated on our webpage. As I mentioned earlier, we had a recent result from the, the study that's ongoing at Spring Hall of non-detect. Um, I, that's, that's just tremendous to be at this point of awareness and already be at a point where we're fairly confident that our treatment options are going to be good to address this. So we're partnering with DEQ currently on a detailed plan for sampling the watershed to identify source. Uh, we have had one test result that showed presence in the Roanoke River. Uh, I think that was referenced recently uh, in some of the news coverage. So prior to that, we had had numerous test results that were non-detect, so it was not present in the river, but we have one result where it was detected. And so at a substantially higher, more than twice as high as the reservoir, it was 139 parts per trillion. And so with that, we're looking at a more detailed plan to go up in the watershed and do additional sampling to try to identify source. And that will be DEQ's responsibility for source control. So VDH has also signaled it will provide assistance and funding uh, for GAC treatability study. They did award the authority a grant to complete a study. That study is currently underway. And one of the benefits of this, there's not many utilities that are this far along in dealing um, with the compound. And so we will provide those results to other utilities so that can help them inform their treatment choices and decisions going forward. So we will have to make some infrastructure improvements at Spring Hollow. As I mentioned, the original intent of the GAC was placed for another uh, treatment reason. And in order to make use of it fully and efficiently for this particular compound, it's going to require us to make some, uh, some process changes so that that's optimized. Uh, this will entail more frequent exchanges of the carbon media than what you would be expected to do under a, a, a TOC treatment protocol. So with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions or? Questions? David Chairman. Yeah, um, <clears throat> I'm in, interested. Uh, so in one of the e emails I read 
uh, you really haven't traced the source where it might be coming from. You just mentioned some possibly, and we're talking about the HFPO-DA. So if the, if the main source of Spring Hollow is Roanoke River, mm -hmm. I, I would be interested to know if Salem is picking it up down downstream in their facility. Have you all talked with them? So anytime that we get a positive result of anything, uh, test-wise, yeah. so so immediately when, when we receive the 139 part per trillion result, we send that to the city of Salem for their awareness. Right. Uh, we have regularly communicated with the city of Salem. They're interested in this issue. Their intake has been sampled. But as I mentioned, we had a whole body of testing that showed it was not present in the river, which was creating some consternation in terms of the investigation because so often we'd see a non-detect in the river. And so that actually led us, atmospheric deposition is a risk for this particular compound. Mm -hmm. And so we have initiated atmospheric uh, testing at the reservoir. Uh, the first one has been sent off to the laboratory. That's a 30 day testing uh, on atmospheric deposition as you basically expose the water to atmosphere. And so we'll have the first results back. Um, I, I think that's less likely now because of the result that we found in the river. And so the question we now have is, is it uh, an intermittent discharge? What's the source of the discharge? Uh, we're making good progress with DEQ. We're actually, uh, the state authorized 20 uh, sampling events, and these are very expensive tests at this point. The, these tests are, are quite expensive. So the state's authorized 20 tests. We have a substantial budget for our own testing, so we're working with DEQ to optimize that sampling schedule so we can get out and begin to narrow it down. Our concentration now is North Fork, South Fork. And so once we know North Fork, South Fork, if we can see a result there, that just helps us back up the tracing until we get to the source. So uh, follow-up question. So the, the new filter you're talking about, did that contribute to where you, it was undetectable? Does that have any bearing on it? Yes, sir. So this, the, the actual result is post-treatment. Okay. So these are post-treatment results. So it's gone through the GAC. It's still present uh, in the reservoir in that range of likely 30 to 40 parts per trillion. So it comes into the process, goes through treatment. With the GAC, the renewed media, uh, we were able to achieve a non-detect. And that's our hope is once we get it fully optimized that that's just going to be a consistent result. And, and we'll be removing the compound. So what's your timetable for replacing that filter system? So the media is completely replaced. Okay. And while it's, uh, th there are piping changes that make it less than ideal for this use, but our staff, that's one of the things we're working through, the correct procedures uh, we brought in. Uh, we have some expertise from the university, or from North Carolina State University, uh, Dr. Detlef Canapi is part of our team. He's had a lot of experience of this in North Carolina, so we're working through a full study to look at how to optimize our treatment practices so that this is a consistent result. Okay. Mr. North. Yeah. Uh, good presentation. Appreciate the update. It was kind of timely because a citizen called me the other day about another subject, and while on the phone mentioned a, uh, some research being done at Northwestern University regarding forever chemicals. I don't know if that can help in y'all's uh, search to improve things, but uh, I've shared that with Mr. Kaywood, and I think he passed it on to Mr. McAvoy. So for whatever it's worth, you know, read it and see if it can help you. Because I know she was concerned enough that she, she did her own research and shared it with me. So Those are all helpful. We're reading a lot of research papers, yeah. have been for some time. Uh, actually, we're working with the University of North Carolina currently. They have invented a sensor. Uh, that can detect this compound. It's not commercially produced, but we're hopeful um, to be able to be a pilot location where it would give us an opportunity to, to then actively monitor the river for the presence. Thank you. A cool. uh, couple questions. Um, having spent too many years of my life dealing with Dixie Caverns and uh, EPA and DEQ, um, is PFAS or the Gen X it, is it soluble in water or is it heavy, like the heavy metals that would sink down to, I remember like with Dixie Caverns and the heavy metals and the lead, it was down more in the sediment uh, in, the, in the creeks and the rivers and we had to do the cleanup there. 
uh, so with this, is it more soluble in water, or does it, because of its heaviness, sink and collect maybe in the sediment? Good question. It, it's such a broad chemical class. Um, most of the compounds of concern, particularly HFPODA, actually tend to be uh, in, in liquid column. They don't have as much affinity for the solids. In fact, one of the treatment technologies that's currently being researched uses air. Uh, it's, it's kind of akin to a surfactant. Mm -hmm. And so it's using air to try to bring it up and concentrate it in the top of column. Uh, there are other uh, chemicals in this class that may have more affinity for solids. It's just a very large chemical class. And so I think it's gonna be interesting to watch as this evolves into discussions about how we address in landfills, uh, wastewater plants, water facilities, to understand the potential routes of exposure. Okay. Um, at the beginning of your briefing, you had indicated uh, the EPA advisory was based on um, average lifespan of 70 years, and you were saying two liters. So in other words, I'd have to drink two liters of water every day for my life for 70 years before this might cause a problem. Is that accurate? I, yes, yes, for, the, for pretty much, and, and putting it in, in simple to explain terms, correct, is, is over 70 years, if you drank it, now not every part of the population would potentially have a problem, but it's because they're looking at the most sensitive individuals within the population. So sure. who would be most impacted? So, and, and typically where, yes, I turn on the faucet and I drink water, that's one thing. The water that comes from Spring Hollow. Do we know, does the science know, if I treat the water? When I say treat it, um, I, I, I boil water to make coffee or tea. Uh, or I'm boiling water and I put the, the pasta in it. I mean, do we know does, does boiling or pasteurization or any other routine, typical food preparation process that utilizes water, does that, does that process eliminate it or dissipate it or change it? The only two recognized, so it actually requires very high temperatures to destroy these compounds. So the two recognized technologies that are available are reverse osmosis and granular activated carbon. And so uh, when you look at North Carolina, North Carolina, the Cape Fear utilities and Brunswick County utilities um, are dealing with this at magnitudes higher than, than the numbers we're talking about. And so Cape Fear is going with granular activated carbon and then Brunswick County has actually do, initiated a project at $129 million to put in reverse osmosis. And so that's the two recognized. Now there are other technologies in development to, to improve treatability and give us more options, but they're in pilot at best. They're either in lab work or pilot. So we've got some time before any other technology is known. Uh, final question. Um, I, I know we're focusing on Spring Hollow, but uh, I'm, I'm also concerned about uh, well water, and, and typically uh, those citizens who have wells, they have their, their well water, maybe, maybe they send it off to a lab once every couple of years, a lot of times probably don't, but what I'm understanding from you is to detect this, it's a, it doesn't fall within the routine, typical, uh, if I sent a, if I had well water and I sent it off to a lab and I got the results, that that lab analysis doesn't even come close to identifying these. So right. theoretically, I could be getting it out of well water. It's just that the, the testing is not sophisticated enough and much more expensive from what you were indicating that would correct. even reflect that. That's correct, and, and actually the majority of cases that have been studied, uh, there have been substantial impact to well systems. And so in a number of cases where the source has been identified, mm -hmm. uh, the normal solution has been to migrate those citizens off of wells onto the public water supply if available or complete ex extensions of the public water supply to, to basically replace those wells. And so the one challenge I think that's gonna exist is I mentioned how uh, stringent we have to be on the sampling process well, that would apply to the citizens too because you don't, you don't want to self-contaminate a sample sure. unintentionally. Thank you.
Just real quick. Um, I read something that said that this contaminant may have even been airborne and settled on Spring Hollow. So do you want to speak to that? Or sure. That, that, as I mentioned earlier, because we were, um, for, for just about a year, we saw non-detects in the Runnick River. Um, uh, DEQ had completed some initial sampling events, and so it was not found in the river. So that led to the question that if we have these test results accumulating that's not in the river, could there be a potential atmospheric path? So we have initiated atmospheric sampling. However, I, I would again say that with the result that we saw in the river of 139 parts per trillion, that now makes it more likely that it's a water route as opposed to any atmospheric issues. And just one more quick question. And I was relieved that there wasn't any bottled water uh, recommendation. But what's interesting about that is bottled water could even have some of those same contaminants because that would not routinely be tested for these types of issues. That's correct. It does not have a standard applied to bottled water. Bottled water has far less stringent standards than what Isn't we're subject to on a daily basis. Or it comes from the plastic. Isn't it? I know. Thank you. Maybe we should get this checked out before we move along. <laughs> thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. This is a, an excellent briefing. Mm -hmm. Thank you very yeah, much. Thank you. Hmm. Next item on our agenda, item E1, new business. Item E1 is a resolution requesting the U.S. Department of Transportation fund an action plan grant to develop a comprehensive safety action plan for Roanoke County, Botetourt County, and the town of Vinton as part of Safe Streets and Roads for All Discretionary Grant Program. Ms. Cronice. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members of the board. The bipartisan infrastructure law established the SS4A, or Safe Streets and Roads for All, discretionary grant program to fund initiatives to prevent roadway deaths and serious injuries. The U.S. Department of Transportation has appropriated $5 billion for this program over the next five years. The first round of funding for fiscal year 2022 consists of up to $1 billion and has been split between planning and implementation grants. The Safe Streets for All program provides 80% federal funding for a 20% local match. Applicants must first have an eligible safety action plan in place in order to apply for implementation grants and subsequent grant rounds. Staff are requesting an action plan grant for development of a comprehensive safety action plan in partnership with the Town of Vinton and Botetourt County. Applications are due on September 15th. The Botetourt County Board of Supervisors and the Town of Vinton Town Council have both approved resolutions of support and match commitments within the last few weeks. The 20% match is proposed to be split according to locality population. Roanoke County's portion of the match would not exceed $51,000 and will be submitted as a fiscal year 2024 capital improvement program request. Staff recommends approval of the resolution of support. And I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Any questions? Mm -hmm. no, just a comment, Mr. Chair. I'm glad to see that we're going after this. It was mentioned the other day, a billion dollars a year for the next five years on a infrastructure call I was on with transportation and NACO, so congratulations on using some, some of that money coming from the folks north of us. We hope that we will receive funding, fingers crossed, but it's a, well, it's a big carrot they're dangling. I think it's smart to go with a regional approach on it as well, so good luck. Thank Mr. You. Radford. Yeah, uh, just for the lay people to understand this, mm -hmm. what concrete things will you see out of a safety action plan? Well, there are a number of factors that are included in the parameters for a grant application. Uh, what they're really looking at is how to address, or where are the, the fatal and serious injury crashes, and how do you propose to address those? And one of the things is looking towards a zero deaths policy. Um, so there's a number of factors we would include in that study, and we have a rough outline created, but until we have funding um, to be able to start an actual um, action plan, we don't have that defined very carefully yet so so we don't so other I guess other localities uh, have concrete things that they put in place to improve safety that's what I mean yes they have and and this like would require what? that we do the same sorts of steps okay, to, like, to qualify as a safety action plan okay and then once we have the plan in place we can apply for um, funding to actually implement okay, the top project. And that's our thought, and that's one of the things we want to include in our study is basically um, a, a smart scale style concept plan and estimate for our top project so that we're ready to go for the implementation grant application as soon as 
that next round would be available. Okay, so are guardrails like part of the safety action plan? It could be something like that, yes. Okay. That's, but that's a lot of it is, is starting and looking at existing conditions like we do with any of our plans to see where the crash is occurring, why are they occurring, what sorts of populations are involved. Is it cars? Is it pedestrians? Is it bicyclists? Okay. Is it, you know, what's happening and why is it happening so we can start to figure out a plan to address those fatalities and serious injuries. A lot of them, frankly, are on Interstate 81 as well. Okay. Thank you. Which makes it additionally challenging. Mm -hmm. Ms. Cronice, um, assuming that everything works perfectly, and we know it will. It's the um, federal government. <laughs> could you give us a, a rough timeline? I, I know in the agenda report, you know, we're looking at maybe putting in the county's portion of the matching dollars for the 2024 CIP, mm -hmm. but could you walk us through and give us a rough idea of what sort of timeline is involved in this? Sure. As, as best I can. Um, this program was put together very, very recently. Um, there was also a substantial change to the notice of funding opportunity in August when it was announced in May. So we're trying to keep up with the changes and figure out what they, what the parameters are. So what we did find is that they are going to be notifying applicants of awards around the end of this year, beginning of next year. Um, but they also have 12 months in order to, I think, we have 12 months to obligate those funds. So. Finding out that you've been awarded funding is one thing. Getting the notification and being able to start work on the project is another once we have agreements signed and things. And we know that, I mean, with the state, the experience we have with the state is it usually takes a little while to be able to get ready to start spending that money. So we anticipate, you know, a year time frame would be fairly quick for a safety action plan. Um, so we would love to be able to take advantage of the grant round that would open summer of 2023, but I don't think that will be possible if they're not making award announcements until the end of this year. So likely it would be 2024 before we would be ready with a plan and an implementation project to be able to submit. So perhaps this time 2024 is, I, I believe, realistic. But again, we don't, we don't have a lot of details on this program. But as I understand it, we're looking at $1 billion a year for yes. five years. Yes. So you might be unsuccessful in year one, but you'd be successful in year two and still accomplish a positive goal. Well, and I was also curious to see that this is fiscal year 2022 federal funding yeah. that they're looking to award. So it's like they're already late in getting started. Yeah. Yeah. So I think we'll, we'll do the best we can with the tools we have available and, and hopefully be awarded funding to put together a plan within a year with consultant assistance and then submit an implementation grant application as quickly as we can, hopefully 2024. It may be later. I guess if they start in 22, we've got until 27. So. Thank you. Any other questions? If not, I would uh, seek a motion to adopt the resolution for E1. Mr. Mr. Chairman, Board. I make a motion to adopt E1. Second. Okay. We have a motion. We have a second. Madam Clerk. Mr. Peters. Yes. Mrs. Hooker. Yes. Mr. Norwood. Yes. Mr. Radford. Yes. Mr. Mahoney. Yes. Item F1 is uh, first reading of ordinances, an ordinance amending Chapter 5, Animals and Fowl, Article 2, Dogs, Cats, and Other Animals, Section 5-27, Barking or Howling Dogs, and 5-34, Penalties of the Code of Roanoke County, Mr. Lubeck. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members of the board. <clears throat> and as reviewed with the board in a recent work session, the Supreme Court of Virginia in the 2009 case of Tanner versus the City of Virginia Beach ruled that penal ordinances must contain ascertainable standards and that violations must not be determined by police officers on a subjective basis. In reviewing the provisions of the Roanoke County Code, uh, it is clear that Section 5-27, which prohibits excessive barking by dogs, presently does not comply with the Tanner ruling. It does not set forth objective standards uh, for such violations. So before you today is a revised ordinance that does set forth objective standards. It is patterned after uh, similar ordinances that have been adopted by several other Virginia localities. And I would like to, to briefly highlight uh, the main provisions of the ordinance. As drafted, it, it states in subsection A of the uh, revised ordinance, that the harboring or keeping of any dog that causes any sound or noise such that it is plainly audible at least once a minute 
for 10 consecutive minutes, one, inside the confines of the dwelling unit, house, or apartment of another, or two, at 50 or more feet from the animal, is hereby declared to be a public nuisance and shall be unlawful. Now, the, the, or, the code uh, amendments continue, and it is unique in that these code amendments contain a request, um, which I would also like to read. In subsection C, C, it states, it is requested upon the first instance that a specific dog creates a public nuisance, as set forth in subsection A above, that the affected citizens first contact the dog's keeper prior to contacting county, the county police department to attempt to resolve objections with the keeper. And I understand um, that there will be many instances where um, concerns with barking dogs can uh, be resolved congenially between neighbors without the need to involve law enforcement. However, we expect that there may be unfortunate situations in which neighbors will not be neighborly. And in such situations, a request um, by an affected neighbor to control a barking dog may be received poorly uh, by the dog's keeper. Um, through prior interactions, an affected citizen may know the disposition of the dog's keeper and may deem it wise to involve, involve law enforcement from the beginning. And that is why this is included as a request and not a requirement. That being said, it may be necessary and appropriate for our law enforcement officers to involve the affected owners as witnesses in legal proceedings if charges are brought against the dog's keeper. Now, in addition to setting forth these objective standards uh, for barking dogs, it is also proposed that Section 534 of the County Code be, amendment, be amended, which sets forth the penalties for violations of Section 527 and uh, other sections as well for animal nuisances. Uh, section 534 has not been updated for about 16 years. So it is proposed that for a first offense, the penalty will be a fine of not less than $75 nor more than 150. For a second, event, second offense within a consecutive 12 month period, the penalty would be a fine of not less than $150 and not more than 250. And for a third and all subsequent offenses, a fine of not less than 250 and not more than 350. Um, I do recommend that the board approve the first reading, set this matter for a second reading in a public hearing on September 28th, and of course would be happy to answer any questions that you might have today. Any questions, Mr. Lubeck? Mm -hmm. Mr. Rasmus. Uh, <clears throat> Mr. Lubeck, thank you for bringing up uh, I think it's 5-27C. It is requested. And we had talked about that in our work session, <clears throat> that uh, some citizens have already tried contacting their neighbors, and, and they're not uh, welcoming that, yes, sir. that cordial suggestion. But I, I'm glad we changed that, and uh, that will allow them, if they've already done the first instance, then they can go straight to the county. Uh, but I thought also it was interesting to uh, understand that <clears throat> if you recorded the animal for 10 minutes, that would also suffice as evidence to the, uh, to the community service officer. So Yes, sir. And, and on both of those points, uh, even on the first instance, as this is phrased as a request, that there may be instances where a, an affected owner just simply feels uncomfortable uh, contacting their right. neighbor to try to resolve it. So it's not a requirement. It's just it's a suggestion, uh, hoping that neighbors will be neighborly and that they can yeah. solve these problems without uh, calling the police on each other, <laughs> which uh, we, we can expect will we'll hopefully resolve in many instances. And um, on the second point that you made, yes, I, I think citizens will be uh, a, a key part in collecting evidence. Otherwise, it would put the burden on our animal control officers or police officers to be there and to wait and to record and um, to be there for the entire uh, 10 minutes while, while this is happening, while the citizen um, who is there and experiencing it um, can record it at that moment. It, it may be the case that the citizen records the dog barking for, for quite some time, and by the time the officer gets there, the dog is quiet. <laughs> so yes, we, we do expect that this is a, an instance that does require citizen cooperation and will continue to do so. 
No other questions. I would uh, welcome a motion to approve the first reading of this ordinance and to schedule a public hearing and second reading for September 28, 22. And I want to remind everyone and any citizens who are watching, uh, our normal board meeting would be the 27th, Tuesday the 27th. Uh, at our last meeting, we rescheduled that meeting to Wednesday the 28th. And so I just want to alert everyone that uh, our board meeting, the public hearing on this matter, as well as several other matters, will be held on Wednesday, September 28th. Do I have a motion to approve? Mr. Chair, I uh, make the motion to approve F1. And I second. Madam Clerk. Mr. Peters? Yes. Mrs. Hooker? Yes. Mr. Norworth? Yes. Mr. Bradford? Yes. Mr. Mahoney? Yes. Item F2. F2 is an ordinance amending Chapter 13, Offenses Miscellaneous, Article 1, in general, Section 13-5.5, Urban Archery Hunting Season, Roanoke County Code. Ms. Lauer. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, members of the board. Um, today I'm bringing to you a proposed ordinance to amend, as you said, the urban archery hunting um, section of the Roanoke County Code. Section 13.5.5 of the County Code makes it unlawful for any person while hunting deer during the county's archery season to violate a number of county restrictions. Section 13.5.54 includes definitions for bows and arrows that may be used while archery hunting in Roanoke County. In this section, a bow includes all, com all compound bows, crossbows, longbows, and recurve bows that have a peak draw of less than 10 pounds or that are designed or intended to be used principally as toys. The state code defines bow as those bows having a peak draw weight of 10 pounds or more. The county code seems to have meant to uh, mirror the state code, but instead erroneously allows hunting with toy bows instead of prohibiting such. It is recommended that the county code be amended in order for the county's definition of bow to be identical to the definition included in the state code. It is also recommended that the county code be amended in order to reflect the change in the Virginia State Regulatory Agency for urban archery hunting, namely from the Virginia Department of Game and Inland Fisheries to the Virginia Department of Wildlife Resources. There's no fiscal impact associated with this recommended amendment to the county code, and staff certainly recommends that the board approve this proposed amendment. Any questions for Ms. Lauer? If not, I would welcome a motion to approve first reading of this ordinance and schedule our public hearing and second reading for September 28, 2022. Motion to approve. Second. A motion to second. Madam Clerk. Mr. Peters. Yes. Mrs. Hooker. Yes. Mr. North. Yes. Mr. Radford. Yes. Mr. Mahoney. Yes. Thank you. Item F3, uh, Ordinance Accepting and Appropriating Transportation Alternative Set-Aside Program Grant Funds from the, from the Virginia Department of Transportation for fiscal year 2023 and 2024 in the amount of $651,375 for the Glade Creek Greenway through Vineyard Park West in the Benton Magisterial District and in the town of Benton. Ms. Cronice. Thank you very much. The Glade Creek Greenway is identified in the 2018 Roanoke Valley Greenway Plan, which was adopted by the Roanoke County Board of Supervisors in September 2018. The Town of Vinton has constructed two segments of the Greenway, and a third segment is funded and in design. The Town has conceptually scoped a Greenway alignment, Phase 3, that will connect the constructed segment to the proposed Vineyard Park West segment, which we call Phase 4. The Town has obtained surface transportation block grant funding to conduct an engineering study for this Phase 3 piece. The proposed half-mile asphalt Glade Creek Greenway segment in Vineyard Park West, located in both Roanoke County and the town of Benton, will continue to extend the Greenway East towards Vineyard Park East and residential neighborhoods in the city of Roanoke and Roanoke County. These neighborhood connections will enable residents to walk from their homes along the Glade Creek, Glade Creek Greenway to the Tinker Creek Greenway and to the Roanoke River Greenway. Roanoke County Planning, Development Services, and Parks, Recreation, and Tourism staff have collaborated with the Town of Benton and the Virginia Department of Transportation staff on the design of the Glade Creek Greenway through Vineyard Park West. The alignment is intended to avoid existing sports fields, preserve existing access points to Glade Creek, provide an appropriate terminus on the western edge of the park for the Town of Benton's Phase 3 Greenway connection, and meet VDOT design requirements. The Board of Supervisors held a public hearing and adopted a resolution supporting the project at its September 21, 2021 meeting. The Commonwealth Transportation Board adopted the six-year improvement program on June 21, 2022, which included TA program funding. This program provides 80% federal funding for a 20% local match. 
VDOT administers the TA program and Roanoke County will administer the Greenway project. The total amount to be accepted and appropriated is $651,375, which includes $130,275 in local match and $521,100 in federal funding. The required local match was appropriated in the fiscal year 2023 Adopted Capital Improvement Program. Staff recommends approval of the first reading of the ordinance and requests scheduling of the second reading for September 28, 2022. And I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. Any questions? Motion to approve. Second. Madam Clerk. Mr. Peters. Yes. Mr. Sucker. Yes. Mr. Knorr. Yes. Mr. Radford. Yes. Mr. Mahoney. Yes. Uh, it is scary in a way that to do one half mile, it costs that much money. <laughs> Very depressing. <laughs> um, item G in our agenda is second reading of ordinances. Item G1. G1 is an ordinance of the Board of Supervisors, County of Roanoke, Virginia, approving the lease financing of various capital projects for the county and authorizing the leasing of certain county-owned property, the execution and delivery of a prime lease, and a local lease acquisition agreement and finance lease and other related actions. Ms. Gerhardt. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman and members of the board. This is the second reading of the ordinance to authorize the issuance of lease revenue bonds for the fiscal year 22-23 capital projects as detailed in the approved fiscal year 22-32 capital improvement program. The lease revenue bonds will provide funding primarily for the construction of the new Bonsac Fire Station, construction of Phase 2 of the Public Service Center, which includes new offices for Parks, Recreation, and Tourism Administration and North and East Parks and Rec Tourism shops, along with renovations to an existing storage warehouse. It will also include funding to install telecommunication conduit and reconstruct a portion of road at Explore Park to improve cell phone and data service and open up the eastern end of the park for primitive camping and easier access to the Roanoke River. The proposed structure of the bonds are lease revenue bonds through the Virginia Resources Authority in the amount of up to $13 million of bonds, a true interest cost not to exceed 6%, with a term maturity not to exceed 20 years. This is an estimate of the maximum borrowing authority that the county may need. The amount of the bonds of the county issues will depend on interest rate conditions in the marketplace at the time of the bond sale. The bond issues in the amount not to exceed of approximately $13 million will allow the county to stay well within its limits of the county debt policy approved by the board. So staff recommends approval of the ordinance. Any questions, Ms. Gerhardt? If not, I would welcome a motion to uh, approve and adopt this ordinance at second reading. Mr. Chairman, I make a motion we adopt G1. Second. Madam Clerk. Mr. Peters. Yes. Mrs. Hooker. Yes. Mr. Norr. Yes. Mr. Radford. Yes. Mr. Mahoney. Yes. Item G2 is an ordinance accepting and appropriating funds in the amount of $102,200 for fiscal year 2023 for <coughs> shuttle service to the National Park Services, McAfee, Knob, Trailhead Parking Lot, Catawba Magisterial District. Ms. Cronice. Good afternoon again. Um, I'm happy to talk about this item, but there are no changes since the first reading. So if you'd like me to talk about it, I'm happy to do so. Any questions? I'm ready to make a motion. Make a motion. What a great day. The shuttle um, ribbon cutting was awesome. <laughs> I've already had a lot of favorable commentary with that. Mr. Chairman, I'll make a motion to approve. Second. Madam Clerk. Mr. Peters? Yes. Mrs. Hooker? Yes. Mr. North? Yes. Mr. Radford? Yes. Mr. Mahoney? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Item G3 is an ordinance authorizing the approval of a new variable width drainage easement board of to the Board of Supervisors of Roanoke County, Virginia, on property owned by Jennifer Lynn Fowler and Vivian Budge Rearson III, located at 0 Doherty, Ro Doherty Road, Salem, Virginia, for the purpose of drainage improvements, Catawba Magisterial District. And I'm not going to read the tax map number. Uh, Mr. Just Chairman, right member of the board, uh, we have no changes. We recommend that the board uh, accept the uh, easement and approve this ordinance. 
I'll be glad to address any questions you might have. Mr. Chairman, this is in my district, and I would like to uh, make a motion to approve. We have a motion. Do we have a second? Second. Madam Clerk. Mr. Peters? Yes. Mrs. Hookle? Yes. Mr. Noor? Yes. Mr. Radford? Yes. Mr. Mahoney? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Item G4 is an ordinance accepting and appropriating funds in the amount of $559,520 from the Virginia Department of Rail and Public Transportation, Public Transportation for the Cortran Program. <coughs> Ms. Banky. Hello. Hello. Good afternoon, Chairman, members of the board. This is the second reading, and there have been no changes, so staff does recommend the approval of the ordinance. And if you have any questions, happy to answer. No questions? I welcome a motion. Mr. Chairman, I make a motion. We approve number four. Do we have a second? Second. Madam Clerk. Mr. Peters? Yes. Mrs. Hooker? Yes. Mr. Noor? Yes. Mr. Radford? Yes. Mr. Mahoney? Yes. Thank you. This is great news. This is a great program, and uh, I'm glad that staff, Ms. Paula Banke, were able to be successful in their grant application. Item H is public hearings and second reading of ordinances. Item H1 is an ordinance amending section 13-4 of the Roanoke County Code, clarifying and confirming the authority of the Virginia Department of Wildlife Resources to issue certain permits for the taking of wildlife in Roanoke County, Mr. Lubeck. <clears throat> Thank you again, Mr. Chairman and members of the board. There have been no changes since the first reading of this ordinance, and if there are no questions, I recommend that the board receive uh, any public comments through a public hearing and that the board thereafter consider adopting this ordinance. Any questions for Mr. Lubeck? Mm -hmm. no. If not, I would like to <clears throat> open the public hearing. If we have any speakers who want to speak at this public hearing, uh, just want to let you know we would ask you to give your name and address and do it at the podium. Um, you have three minutes to speak. I have no requests. Madam oh, Clerk, man. do you have any requests? Anyone in the audience would like to speak to this item? Hearing and seeing none, I will close the public hearing. I would now ask for a motion to adopt this ordinance at second reading. Motion to approve. Second. Madam Clerk. Mr. Peters? Yes. Mrs. Hooker? Yes. Mr. Norworth? Yes. Mr. Radford? Yes. Mr. Mahoney? Yes. Item I is appointments. Uh, does any board member have an appointment that has not been otherwise given previously to the clerk? If not, we'll go to item J. Item J is our consent agenda. Uh, all matters listed on the consent agenda are considered by the board to be routine and will be enacted by one resolution in the former forms listed below. If discussion is desired, that item will be removed from the consent agenda and will be considered separately. Uh, does any board member wish to remove an item from the consent agenda? Um, if not, I'd want to remind the board that we did add uh, to our consent agenda item C1, which is the resolution expressing appreciation of the board on the retirement of Nancy Gattoni, senior library assistant, on her retirement. She was unable to come today. So we have six items on our consent agenda. I would move the approval of the consent agenda. Do we have a second? Second. Madam Clerk. Mr. Peters? Yes. Mrs. Hooker? Yes. Mr. Norworth? Yes. Mr. Radford? Yes. Mr. Mahoney? Yes. Item K, citizen comments and communications. This item on our agenda, we provide an opportunity for citizens to speak to us on matters of county concern. I have no request, Madam Clerk. Yes, sir, I do not. Item L, item L is reports. Um, I would move that we receive and file all the reports that are listed in our agenda. I have a second. 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 Mr. Clerk. Peters? Yes. Mrs. Hooker? Yes. Mr. Norworth? Yes. Mr. Radford? Yes. Mr. Mahoney? Yes. Item M, reports and inquiries of board members. First up, Mr. North. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a few comments today. I want to thank the fire and rescue team, uh, the police department, and the Department of Environmental Quality for all their efforts regarding the overturned tanker in Hollands uh, this past week. Uh, I'm glad that no one was seriously hurt. 
although I understand the truck driver had a few broken bones. Something like this occurring at a, high, uh, at a later hour could have been more devastating to the community. And I would also like to ask staff to look into where we stand on improvement of that intersection with BDOT. I think it was a long-term item and report back to the board uh, at the request of several citizens and my curiosity. Next, uh, I happened to listen this morning to the Appropriations Committee in Richmond. They held a update on numerous reports. Uh, they had some good news for the month of August. The uh, sales and use tax is up 7.2%. General fund revenues are up 5.4%. Uh, Virginia, though, is 2.6% below the pre-pandemic level in comparison to our sister states in recovery. Uh, Secretary Cummings, finance director, indicated that J.P. Morgan, according to his contacts, predicts a soft landing with strength of jobs leading the way. So that's a good sign as we look down towards the end of the year, first of the year. The governor will be presenting his budget December 15th in Richmond. Uh, next, Greg Burns, who was the tax commissioner, spoke and indicated that uh, taxpayers who filed <laughs> electronically can expect their $250 single or $500 joint return refunds to be made uh, between now and October 17th. And so that's some good news. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Oh, and by the way, the one the reason I li listened at this uh, listened at this call was I heard updates on everything. As for grants, everything, but not a word on education construction grants. I found that to be most interesting. It's almost as if they just fell off the radar screen. And I certainly can only conclude without asking the question, are they still developing the criteria and the parameters? That's the only thing I can figure why they didn't make a report on that. So maybe they will next month when they have their November or October meeting. Thank you. Mr. Radford. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Just want to report a few things. Uh, uh, last week, I attended the uh, Visit Virginia Blue Ridge, uh, their annual uh, meeting event down at Roanoke City Market, uh, along with uh, Mr. Mahoney and Ms. Hooker. Uh, we got to see uh, a lot of the, uh, uh, the 2024 women's cycling that's getting ready for, for Paris. And they, were, uh, they had a big display set up where you could go in there and cycle to try it out. Uh, it was very entertaining uh, and a great networking for, for our regional partners uh, with uh, VBR. Just want to also let you know that work has begun on the Oak Grove Park uh, behind Oak Grove Elementary School. It looks like they're starting with the, uh, uh, the parking area and then continuing along with the work that is planned. And also just a, you know, a plug for our uh, regional airport uh, I took a flight over this weekend, and it, it was great having the convenience to fly out of Roanoke and come back to Roanoke uh, without having to go elsewhere. It just it continued to, uh, I, I'm impressed with, with the things that uh, our new executive director is doing at the airport, and just highly recommend. If you can fly out of Roanoke, you have time, you can <laughs> reserve the, the flight long enough out there, you'll get good fares. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Peters. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. A um, couple things I want to go over. First of all, um, many in the county may know uh, through, through the school systems that uh, Mr. North and I go to church with a wonderful lady um, who passed away um, last week. She was the principal over at Clearbrook Elementary, Karen Pendleton. Um, you know, she, she was a great asset to our school system. Uh, everybody that worked with her seemed to love her. So. Anyway, um, th uh, think about her. Two dollars. Her, her husband actually passed away about 11, 12 years ago. So she leaves behind two young daughters. So please keep them in your prayers. Um, going back to kind of what Mr. North mentioned a moment ago about the tanker trailer truck that was turned over. Um, there was a lot of debate on this board about having a towing committee or towing advisory board. Um, I think this illustrates one of the reasons why that was very much needed because, you know, having those resources readily available that have already been vetted out to come and handle an accident like that. And I think we've had a couple others in the county here in the last little bit, unfortunately, uh, with some heavy-duty trucks 
Um, so I'm, I'm glad that we, we did we did that. Um, if anybody's looked at the news today, inflation is continuing to rear its ugly head. Uh, I have voiced concern about this before, and I'll voice it again today that um, while Roanoke County is in wonderful financial shape, we have great leadership in our finance department. Um, I, I will raise my concern again that as we're looking ahead to inflation that seems to not be letting up um, because someone in Washington can't understand e basic economics that you can't have more money chasing the same number of goods, it causes inflation. Um, if you do any history, uh, any work on financial history, many times prime rate has to get above inflation in order to bring down inflation. Now, the number this morning was 8.3%. I think the prime rate is currently at five and a half. Um, I think we got a lot of pain ahead of us. Um, and my concern is uh, making sure Roanoke County stays in the great financial shape it's in. I know that in our, in our financial policy as we look to borrow money, uh, we have a 6% threshold there. Um, you know, I think borrowing in the future may become a challenge. Mm -hmm. But uh, again, I know we have some uh, wonderful, wonderful people in our finance department, uh, along with our administration, who, who will keep us well. Um, I think another report that came out yesterday kind of was concerning to me that housing has uh, is only has taken its steepest dive in 20 years or something of, the, of that magnitude. And being that a large hunk of our, uh, our uh, excuse me, home values, uh, a large part of our tax revenue comes from real estate you know, could, could pose a problem in the future. But again, uh, as Mr. Mahoney said earlier, I'm not trying to be the pessimist, but I also know uh, being, in, being, being in the finance uh, work for 25 years, unfortunately I've seen this come before. And then the last thing, um, I'm proud to sit here today, and uh, it was 30 years, to go, 30 years ago today I was voted in as a member of the Benton First Aid Group. Mm -hmm. um, and I bring that up, not for me, but for the people that may be watching this, that, you know, if I can do it, anybody can do it. <laughs> that wasn't meant to be funny, but uh, <laughs> thanks, Debbie. Um, but truly, it's, it, it's something I've, I've enjoyed doing. I've enjoyed working alongside of our other police, fire and rescue. Many of the volunteers that I started work with, working with back in the day are now part of our career staff. I'm, one of them was in our audit committee earlier today. But, um, you know, I just say that to say I, I would hope anyone watching this that, you know, find something to do in your community and give back. Mm -hmm. Good. Thank you for it's your 30 fun. years. Yes, thank, thank you, you for your service. It's been Mr. fun. Mr. Chairman, just two items quickly. Um, as alluded to earlier, we recently held the uh, McAfee Knob Trailhead Shuttle Ribbon Cutting, and it was just really an exciting day because of the use of that parking area there at the trailhead being um, way over capacity, especially in our peak seasons, and it's, it's such a beautiful area, and it is so popular. I am very thankful for this opportunity that is grant and user-funded uh, and it's really going to be helpful, especially as the, uh, we approach construction for the pedestrian bridge. So I'm very appreciative of that. And thank you to all the people, Paula, thank you, and others who really worked hard to make that happen. And Megan, thank you. You all are wonderful. And then my second point is on um, Sunday I went to a 9-11 remembrance service at uh, Temple Baptist Church this past Sunday. And um, it's hard to believe that that horrible day was 21 years ago. Um, and may we never forget, may we continue to honor those who have uh, sacrificed all for their country and for fellow citizens. That's all, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Um, two things. Uh, I want to echo uh, what Mr. Radford talked about, how last week on, I think, the September 8th, uh, three of us, Mr. Radford, Ms. Hooker, and I were able to attend uh, Virginia Blue Ridge's uh, 35th annual meeting, and uh, what, what uh, was very moving to me was the speech of uh, Kristen Armstrong. She was a gold medal, gold medal cycling winner at, was it 2008, 2012, and 2016? Mm -hmm. It was over three different Olympics. She won gold in that event, and she gave a very moving and to me very inspiring speech of 
the hurdles that she overcame and had to overcome. Uh, uh, she and her husband were having a baby, and the Olympic officials were saying, oh, well, you're a woman and you're having a baby and you can't compete in the Olympics, uh, which is kind of ridiculous. But uh, she talked about how she had to overcome those different uh, obstacles uh, in order for her to be able to compete for the United States in the Olympics. Yes. Moving speech. Uh, second item I want to mention is, I believe it was on August 26th, I had the opportunity with my family to attend the 50th anniversary celebration of Penn Forest Elementary School. Uh, all three of my children, our children, attended Penn Forest. Um, my granddaughter and other grandchildren are attending Penn Forest now. Uh, many of the original principals and other principals and teachers were there from that time. And it was a nice, wonderful uh, celebration. Uh, unfortunately, the weather didn't cooperate. It rained on us, so we all had to go inside. But uh, it was a very nice, uh, very nice event. And it's uh, uh, Penn Forest was one of those elementary schools that was open classroom. And if you remember back in the day, open classrooms were the thing in education. And for some reason, they, they don't like open classrooms these days. I guess uh, nothing is permanent in the education establishment. Uh, with that, um, item N, uh, work sessions. Item N1 is a work session to review strategic priorities and work plan with the Board of Supervisors. We will be doing that upstairs uh, on the third floor. So the Board will now recess and go to the third floor of the work session. When we adjourn again, I want to remind everyone that our next meeting is on Wednesday, September 28th. With that, Let's go upstairs and do a work session.